especially intellectual enjoyment. But if you want something to, if you want a level of appreciation where you feel something deep within your essence to be stirred and to better feel the meaning of the mitzvah, then my suggestion is to rush and run to study the Zohar. Mm -hmm. Or at least find a, someone who can share it with you, even if it means you don't actually open up the, the, the safer of the Zohar, certainly have it in your house, and certainly the Zohar should be in every shul, and certainly the Zohar should be in every yeshiva, um, so at least be around it, or, 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 or the t there should be leaders that teaching it where it becomes the surrounding light, the Orma Kif, so that the mitzvot can be felt and experienced on a much, much deeper level that resonates with our neshama. So, so my point is, is that there may not be a specific concept in the Zohar that will change the halacha about something. There may not be. In but, fact, there could be a difference in opinion, or it may not even have an opinion at all. But that doesn't mean that that's the only reason why someone should study the Zohar, to get a better understanding of the halacha. Because, I mean, the halacha is one element of Judaism, of the Torah. Not to, not to minimize it in any way, because it's the it's the garment, it's the chitzoniyot, it's the outer, and we need a body, but we also need a soul. Sure, we could we could study the body, we could study the body, we could know all the information about the body, but don't we want to know a little bit about the soul? And the Arizal is very clear that Talmud Babli and Halacha is this is the body, it's not the soul. However. Once you learn about the soul, you'll better understand how the body works. I know this as the doctor, as you know, as a quote unquote scientist or someone interested in science. I'm interested in science only in so far as it is a credible reflection of the root of the shoresh, of the, of the inner dimension of the Torah. And then science becomes fascinating. Well, there's an element of fascination about science in that insofar as it evokes wonder and a sense of awe but even beyond that is that when we when we can see the body as a reflection of the soul or the the the, the science as a reflection of the shoresh of the of the the spiritual world then it becomes an experience that's exhilarating that is unifying that connects us to our, our source, connects us to ourselves, which is something that uh, is an experience of, of what the Torah is uh, offering us, that we all have the potential and the opportunity to experience. And that is what the days of Mashiach is all about. And that's why the, the Navi says, what is Mashiach? Ki malah ha'aretz de'at Hashem. It's not that we're going to be rushing to the mikvah on Mashiach. No, uh, we're going. You'll be in it. <laughs> but more important than that is that we're going to see the knowledge of Hashem everywhere around us. We're going to see it in the trees. We're going to see it in the mountains. We're going to see it in other human beings because Malah Ares Deat Hashem. So yes, halacha is important. It certainly is. We need to know it, but we're going to understand it better when we understand the soul. When we understand the premium. So therefore we need we need both. We need the body and we need the soul. But what's a body without a soul? So that's that's a good question. I'll just say one thing. I, I don't remember if it was um maybe even the 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 Vilna Gon who said to be a posek you really need to know Kabbalah which is a strange thing. You'd think that would be a strange thing for the Vilna Gon to say. The Vilna Gon was actually a Kabbalist. He was fluent in, 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 in you know, the works of Kabbalah as much as anyone else was. Um, you know, to, to me, that, that actually is not striking at all that the Vilna Gon would say that because he believed that the Torah was all interconnected, that there was like one, that there really was one Torah. It wasn't just like, the arm doesn't know what the foot is up to. He really believed that they're they're all about integration. 
But there still is a little bit of a tension between, and by the way, I couldn't get us on Facebook Live through Zoom. I tried eight times. So I finally just took my phone and I'm recording separately on Facebook Live, um, basically recording my, my tablet from my phone because that's the, the level of technology that I'm up to. So just to explain what's going on, I tried, believe me, I tried. Um, okay, so that, that's a little bit about, there is a little bit of a tension there because I think that it's it's like a question of who's king, you know, is the is the posek the king or is the makubal the king? Like who should you go, I, I, there shouldn't have to be a decision where you have to pick between which one. It depends. If I want to know the halacha, I'm going to go to the posek. If you want to know the, the meaning of the, the deeper meaning of the Torah, I would go to the Kabbalist. But for whatever reason, there's, there, there's sometimes a slight tension between the two to the point where you actually have the Zohar kind of um, un, sometimes being so supportive of of every halacha and every every diktuk of, and, and everything, but on the other time saying that people who only respect what it calls pshat, which pshat doesn't mean the literal meaning in the Zohar, it really means the halachic interpretation, are, are like children. Like it, it kind of ridicules the people who, who make everything about Torah, just about halacha, and sees them as 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 unsophisticated and not spiritually uh, evolved. But but let's go on to talk about a little bit. What's your uh, uh, like two uh, two or three themes in the Zohar? I know any if I asked you for one theme that's your favorite that would take up a, you know hours of time. So keep it short to three or four minutes each. But like two or three of your favorite key ideas in this hour? Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one that's related to um, Pesach, you know. Um, the, the question is, why did we have to go down to Egypt in order to be redeemed and then receive the Torah? Very strange. And I'll, I'll bring it back even one step before that. When Abraham asked Hashem, how do I know that you're going to really, Hashem, that you're really going to get me all of this. Mm -hmm. Give my descendants the land of Israel, and you're going to make the Jewish people um, as numerous as the, the, the stars in heaven and the sand on earth. Show me proof. Show me. What does Hashem say? That you should know that your descendants are going to go down to the land of Egypt and they're going to be servants in a land that is not theirs. Now that's an answer? Would, does that answer Abraham's question? I think they say that's, that's the, when, you, when you question God, God says, I'll give you an answer that you don't want. <laughs> yeah, but Abraham loves it. He accepts it. That's a, wow. He, 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 he took that as a great answer. Oh, wow, thank you, Hashem. That's a great answer. It's a very bizarre answer. But it's not. Because a consistent theme throughout the Zohar is the idea of ki yisrona or ben that light can only be perceived in the context or in contradistinction to the darkness that precedes it. And a vessel with out light, light without a vessel is impossible. And vessel is darkness. Vessel is, 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 a, is an absence, it's a chisaron, it's a, it's a deficiency. Ah, so now that we know, and I'm veering off a little bit, but I'll, I'll come back. So now that we know that the definition, and this is all from the Baal Sulam and spread throughout the Zohar, but again, it gives us a way of thinking and a way of understanding that I always say this, that it changes, and I know Leon, you would appreciate it, that it, it, it rewires the network of our neurology, of our neurons, and I believe it. Now, is that the you, you need this deficit and the sense of lack in order to experience light. <clears throat> and there's no light without this 
black, without a vessel, ain't, ain't orderly clean. There's no such thing as light without this vessel. And, and, and I think the Zohar talks right. about this in uh, in in Lech Lecha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, we actually had the privilege. Remember, we um, I, I'm just going to uh, take this opportunity to to mention that that uh, that Rafi, Dr. Kelman, um, was the one who brought Rabbi Brandwine first to the Kalbach Shul and the JCC, and then to Los Angeles to the Happy Minion. And to uh, Florida, to to uh, the Shoalville Harbor, where Rabbi Brandman was able to teach hundreds, maybe th- actually thousands of people through a series of uh, of events, Shabbatons and Day of Kabbalah. And one of the great things is at that time I had this the Zohar group on Wednesday morning. Uh, now I shifted it to Wednesday night. It's a new one after we took a break, but I had about ten. Ten guys who would come, you know, pretty consistently, and and one one week when Rabbi Bramon was was here, he came that Wednesday morning, and it happened to be Parshas Lechacha, and he gave such a, a knockout sheer on exactly this thing, and I'll remember it forever. It was wow. and, and 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 we could talk about Rabbi Brandwine, uh, but but what a privilege to be able to spend time with a, a living Kabbalist, and I'll just wow. mention that that Rafi. Uh, studied for how, how many years did you uh, to take a minute to tell everyone about Rabbi Brandwine? How many years did you study with him? Thirteen years. Wow! And you used to study with him at some crazy time, like two a.m. or something. What, what time yeah, did? Four, four in the morning. Four in the morning. Yeah. How did Chasi let you do that? I don't know. <laughs> you gotta you gotta give her more credit, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess she. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. I, I did it before we were married too, but certainly. We, and by the way, that's how you met Chasya, because it was in Florida with Rabbi Brandwine. So you got to get, you know, that's you true. you got to give him and me a little finder's fee there. You know, I think you've given the finder's fee many times over. Wow, that's very true. Yeah. Wow, I, I didn't put all the pieces together. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, incredible. So getting back, so but this concept of you know night that precedes darkness really starts off at the beginning of the Torah, by the era of the Boker, that there was darkness and then there was Boker, then there was light, that the night precedes the darkness. But to know, Hashem says, that yes, there will be light after the darkness, and then Hashem, and then that was exactly what Avram needed to hear, because he understood the how the reality works. He understood, you know, the cosmology he understood the nature of reality and the nature of spirituality. And this is the most important proof that Hashem could give him that yes, we will be redeemed because for sure, when there's darkness, there will be light that emanates from the darkness. Now, so this is a consistent theme. Now let's get to the idea of why we had to go to Mitzrayim. Why Mitzrayim? There were other nations that we could have gone to uh, and it, it to be put into quote-unquote slavery. Or Hashem could have waited years later and brought us to Greece, the ancient the Greek Empire, or, or whatever. What, what was it about Egypt? So getting back to the idea of Ratzon, that there's the idea of Ratzon, we know about Yetzahara, Yetzato, the evil inclination and the good inclination. Can, can you translate Ratzon? Ratzon is will. Um, but it, there are many levels. It's not like willpower. It's a very uh, primordial spiritual um, element within us that is our essence. You know, if you ask someone, you know, point to who who you are or where you are. A lot of people will point to the head, which is bizarre. Some people will maybe point to the heart, which is also a little bit off, but there's really no place to point because the will is within us, is everywhere within us, but it's not localized within us. It's can, can you, because so, so you're saying Ratzon is like a keter, meaning it, it, it somehow transcends your your biology. Yeah. 
Can I, can I, okay, that's, that's fascinating, but let's, let's, you know, to, 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 to make the question, to make the point clearer so you can answer it possibly is on the one hand, we say the Ratzon is, is the ultimate Ratzon is God's Ratzon, God's will. And, and then the question is like, what is his will? If, if, if there's some element of it that we could understand, perhaps we could say it's Ratzon Lahashpia. He, he wills to give for the good of, 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 of humanity, of society. And, and the world is a tov lehet, you know, the teva tov lehetiv, like, like, like many of the thinkers have said, God's nature is, is of, of goodness. Olam chesed yibaneh, the psalmists say, King David says the world is, is based on God's chesed, his kindness, his love. And our ratzon, this is a you know a very basic idea in, in Rabbi Ashlag's uh, Kabbalah, is is generally starting out as ratzon the we we want like a child wants to be nursed, uh, uh, an adult wants uh, food and 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 intimacy and and to be realized and to be safe and so on, and somehow we're, you know our avoda is to to somehow borrow from God's ratzon, his his kind of higher level of ratzon to give and become more godlike. Is there, would there be a better use of the word in in, in dividing it into two words? In other words, but why, why both ratzon? Like, why do they have, why is it the same word and one is God and one is like kind of, the, the source of all sin. Why can't we divide it into, let's say, um, find two different words. One is like uh, a ta'iva, like a desire, and one is ratzon, a will, like a more pure will. Is there, can you? That's a very good question. And the answer is because Hashem Achad, Ushmo Achad. We, we're monotheists, right? We believe in monotheism. If you take monotheism to its logical conclusion, it means everything is one. It's not just that God is one. God, the the the, enti- the, the our reality is part of God. God is not limited to our reality, but our whole reality is God is part of God. If that's the case, how could we say that we have one will that's uh, that's that's defined as a and another aspect of us that's defined as B, that contradicts the, the essence of monotheism. It contradicts the idea of Hashem Achad, Yishmo Achad, that Hashem is one, and His name is one. Who's His name? His name is B'nai Yisrael, is Israel, is Yisrael. But, but, that, but isn't that idea of a contradiction of God's oneness inherent to having a bria with a, with bichira with free choice because people i mean ah. isn't that a bigger problem than just the ratzon okay. it's another good question so we have two good questions without a good answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know something Here, here's something incredible about the zohar and the policy right we ultimately we don't have free will ah. we don't have free will you know why because we are destined to greatness. You want something mm. less than greatness? Well, find a different reality. Mm-hmm. That, that, that it's impossible. So this is so this is the Balasulam's answer. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We don't have free will. Ultimately, we do not have free you, you, will. You know who I uh, how I found that out? I I told um, I told Rabbi. You know, I'm very into the the Ishbitzer, so I told Rabbi Brandwine about the Ishbitzer's thing on not really having free will. He's like, yeah, he showed me in the Baal Sulem, in yeah. the Talmud Esa Spheres. He said, it's the same, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, well, I like that too, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, absolutely. The Ishbitzer, there's some great overlap. Um, one day we should have a talk about that too. Um, there's a lot of overlap, but they've also thought about similar questions. Which was interesting, because they lived. When did the when when did the Ishbitzer pass? The Ishbitzer passed about a hundred a hundred and and seventy years ago. Oh, so that's it's before the Baal of course. Yeah. But you know, you could see that those ideas were already percolating. Um, you know, ever since um, the Ramchal, that um, a very very modern um, conception of the questions 
we're beginning to develop and certain and the answers um, I think that's why people appreciate the Ishmael so much the modern mind and that's why the modern mind is hungry for the Bala Sula whether they know it or not because of the, the, the refinement of language, of the types of questions that are asked and the types of answers that are given, but in, 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 the, in the language that they're given um, mm. is, is so, so critical uh, that it becomes um, you know, so appealing to um, the modern mind that needs this very, very specific type of language um, in order for us to resonate with it. So um, getting back you know, to your question, is that one, that there is no free will, that ultimately our Ratzon is gonna be fused with the divine Ratzon period. Uh, therefore, you know, all the roads are gonna to lead to that unity. Um, now, we have a choice. The choice is, yeah, the, the path of suffering or the path of the Torah. The Bala Salaam is very clear about that, that we can reach the Maratikun, the final correction, um, either through suffering, you know, hardship and a lot of um, trial and tribulation and, you know, basically going through all these experiments to see, well, what is a good way to live? And, uh, you know, how much suffering does humanity have to go through until we finally get it? Hey, wait a minute. We've been designing the experiment all wrong for 6,000 years. So are we getting closer to it now? I think so. But are we very susceptible to falling back to where we were? Absolutely. And will we fall back? I'm sure we will. The question is to what degree. But we, we, we have to be vigilant at this point to realize that there are forces that are going to try to pull us back unless we now take this opportunity and move forward and try to accelerate uh, the, the process of the redemption of, re of reaching that mm. uh, will of Hashem by, you know, by through the path of the Torah, the path of the Torah as understood through the Zohar, mm -hmm. not by what we're necessarily being taught by quote unquote leaders. No, it's what is being taught by the Zohar and understood through someone that has that capacity to incorporate the entire Zohar into his heart and consciousness, and then be able to disseminate it in ways that we can uh, uh, download it and understand it, because the language resonates with us, and we could go step by step and to reach the level of great, great uh, tzaddikim and Kabbalists only because we were taken there through a step-by-step -step process based on a language that we can understand. Anyway, so we have the opportunity now to the path of the Torah as understood through the Zohar to accelerate the coming of Mashiach. Be, that's why the Yeshayahu says, Be ito achishena, that Mashiach could come in its time through trial and error, through, through tribulations and suffering and pain and, and, and war and epidemics and personal hardship or through the path of the Torah that will teach us how to accelerate the coming of Mashiach through the Zohar. That means studying the Zohar, or at least listening to, the, to some Zohar or, or we could discuss that at another time. What does it mean to learn the Zohar? Can you can you give uh, an example of that? Yeah, I will. I of, of of how Mashiach will come, not just like like because you do this, a miracle will happen, but more like the cosh, like an explanation of how we'll actually see a shift in consciousness from an idea in the actual Zohar. Can you give an example? Yeah. yeah. So I'll just finish up your question. So one is that ultimately there is one red zone. Uh, we don't have free will. Well, our free will, and this is a, a, an incredible article by Rabbi Oh, uh, Reno, Reno wants you to translate Be'ito and Achishana. Okay, so it means in its time, the, 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 the Mashiach will come uh, in its time, or I will accelerate it. 
So the, the obvious question is, which one is it? Is it going to come in its time, or is it going to uh, uh, be accelerated? So in its time means to, um, you know, the slow process of, you know, trials and tribulations, of unfortunately, uh, suffering and war and plague and epidemics and, and all of that. Or that through the learning of the Torah, uh, through, the, through the Zohar, that we can um, uh, accelerate the, the coming of Mashiach. So one, getting back real quickly, is that one is that um, we don't have the free will that people think we have. And two, the, the reason why there has to be a single singular language of Ratzon is because there's all, everything has to be unified. And that's why we don't have... A, Rabbi Bremen is very clear about this. We don't have, you know, uh, a, an evil inclination and a good inclination. Yetzirah, Yetzirah. We have one will. They can fragment into into Yetzirah, Yetzirah, but that's just a fragmentation. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, they can be united into one will, which is which is a whole philosophy of Rabbi Ashok of how do, how do you accomplish that? And 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 this is very. This is the reason why he uses this type of language is because it, through this language of, you know, the Ratzon and the, the, the evil inclination and the good inclination, which is one is the idea of giving selflessly, love selflessly, and the other one is, you know, what we want to take for ourselves. Um, they, they, through a formulation that Rabbi Ashford is, you know, very clear about that we see throughout the Zohar, of two great lights that Hashem created, that they could be a fusion into one light, that even though there's there is multiplicity in these lights, but yet there will be singularity. Okay. So, so you're you're talking about it's like there's a dual duality and non-duality, and and the duality is when you still think there's like a Yetzatov Yetzahara, but then eventually you'll realize that there isn't. Exactly. It's kind of like uh, exactly. you'll exactly. yeah. With both of your hearts will become one beating heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course we have a you know a right ventricle and a left ventricle. And, so do you, and, do you think that he that that he differs from like the the Tanya the Chabad uh, teachings or 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 they could come together at some point? No, they're they, just of course they have to come. Look, uh, you know the the the, the Balatanya when he wrote, of course, was the Ruach Hakodesh, but that doesn't mean that it's the um, and I have to be very careful with the way I say this, that um, that I, I do believe that the that they they, they can be fused together. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do believe also that you you have to. I think it's I shouldn't say you have to, but um, from what I've learned is that it's preferable to find a teacher uh, mm-hmm. that is in our generation rather than a teacher. From the past, even if that teacher may be greater on some level. Yeah, well, um, I think Chabad would would say that's why they have the they they have the Tanya updated by the current Rebbe. I don't know who the current. You know what I mean? Meaning it's yeah. it's uh, they 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 do believe they have that because they have a tradition that continues. But I hear what you're saying. You're saying like uh, right, right, yeah, right. I think that look when you're dealing in the world of the spiritual, the deep, deep spiritual worlds, it, it all comes together. But the question is, what can we benefit from most being in the world that we're in, where we're, where we're, you know, so far away from that level where we can see everything is one. So, um, you know, my, my, my feeling is that if you want to unify all phenomena of existence, both within us and external to us and to understand how one day there will be a complete unification of reality both within and external my suggestion is to study the Baal Sulam and it doesn't mean you can't have another Rebbe as well mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, I, I know Shlomo said this that you know you could have two Rebbe's but the, you, have you to know what he meant when he said that beneficial for. I think Shlomo meant well, whoever your rabbi is, and Rabbi Nachman. That was slightly... Yeah, okay. Look, you know, I'll tell you something. Like, over Shavuos, I was reading, you know, some things that Rabbi Torsky was writing, and, and other people, and the Hasidus, of course, you know, there's, 
it's kind of like they're mutually exclusive. But uh, but what I what I'm saying is the, the the reason why the czar ultimately has to be learned, as opposed to just Hasidus, is because the Hasidus is on the psychological level of understanding. But the czar is the entire picture. It's the mm-hmm. whole cosmology. It's the science. It's the way the brain works. It's the way. It's a unified field theory. It gives us the understanding of the whole shebang, so that when we walk in the street, we'll carry infinity within us. We'll not only know um, how to be kind to somebody, but we'll know how to be kind to someone on a much much deeper level than even. Hasidus can give us because we're going to see the root of it and we're going to see the reminder mm. to do so in the world that the Zohar has constructed for us. In a, a, an alternate reality that's constructed by the Torah itself. That's why it says, um, and all your sons will be uh, students of Hashem, right? And the and the mentor says, "Al tikra banayach el banayach." Don't 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 read it as your sons, your children will be, uh, you know, will learn the from Hashem. But your builders, that the build the Bnei Yisrael will be builders, architects of a new reality, mm. uh, of a new world that we'll be living in. Will be housed in a different w- world where there'll be, uh, it will be totally okay to have, you know. Uh, we we won't need social distancing in this uh, new reality, because we'll we'll um, well I'm not telling you not to you know obey social distancing, but at some point we're going to live in a world where the it will will be reminded we'll see the element of this Ratzon in every aspect of reality and in the way reality is constructed, the way we understand. The nature of reality will be understood through the lens of uh, of Kabbalah, and will be the reality that Bnei Israel will be the architects of a new reality. That and then the world will say, uh, "Look at this great nation, mm. that this great nation of wisdom." Uh, mm. That who, what a great nation that Hashem is so close to. Am Navon Bechacham. What a, an intelligent nation. Wow. Look at their wisdom. And the Torah is not saying, oh, wow, look at how many scientists come out of Jew, out of Jewish people. Or look mm-hmm. at all these great mm-hmm. doctors or whatever. The it, scientists. It, That's if, not what the Torah if, says. Well, I think a lot of Jewish mothers, a lot of Jewish mothers would disagree. <laughs> I think your parents are very proud that you're a doctor. Now that you're a doctor, you can also become a Kabbalist. You know, like yeah. the first the first level of, of achievement for a, a Jewish uh, child is to be a doctor. Anything after that is good also, you know. Yeah, but the but <laughs> two, two questions for you, Rafi. These are not mine. One is from Leon and one is from Joyce. Um, one, if we can choose that, because this is referring to something you said earlier, if you can choose the path of suffering or the path of Torah, isn't that free will? Um, and then maybe I'll give you the second question now also, because you might want to do the second question first, because it might be easier or not. Can you suggest a translation of the text of the Zohar? Okay. Um, okay. Which one are you doing first? <laughs> well, I'll answer the first question. You see, Leon... There are mirages of free will. I don't know, Tell you spoke about this. I even remember having a conversation with you. I even remember where I was when I, when you answered this question to me. I was getting out of camp. I think it was downtown. And you really, it was, we were talking about Mishpitsa. But I'll never forget, you know, your answer. Um, and there's definitely some similarity to what I'm going to be saying now. That there are many levels of um, our experiences and many levels of um, uh, delusions of consciousness. Um, but that, that's okay, um, because they're necessary to uh, perpetuate uh, our day-to-day living and our existence and believing in our day-to-day existence and our day-to-day reality without feeling, wow, this is just a joke. What am I doing? So the. The, the idea is that there are many, many layers of reality, and there are many, many layers of uh, lack of freedom 
um, and freedom um, intertwined in a big, big picture of no freedom. Because the big, big picture is no freedom because we're all destined to receive God's greatness. We're all destined to be one with Hashem. We're all destined to be prophets. Like in the first place I make we there was millions of prophets and prophetesses everywhere. It, we're destined for that and even more, even more. We're destined to be levels like Elio and Navi. And, 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 and the highest, highest levels, we, we don't even know what's in store for us based on the Zohar. It's mind boggling. So that's the ultimate reality. But in the many, many subdivisions, the truth is that there, there, there seems to be a level of free will. But once we pass that fork of choosing that seems very, very free to us to do so, we're going to realize after we made that choice, you know something? I never even made that choice. That choice was thrusted upon me. And we all realize this when we think back at critical decisions that we made. When we cross that border of the decision that we made, don't we feel that we never really made that decision? That that decision was made for us, but we're so happy it was? You know what they say, well, they should say, is that we don't really discover anything. Scientists don't really discover anything, but discoveries discover us. Meaning to say... The, us, the, the, the scientist just discovers what's already there, just not... Of course. Aware, we weren't aware of it before. It's not like, Absolutely. It's not like, it's not like Newton may there be gravity, or Einstein made MC whatever... You know, they just figured it out. Yeah, they would be the first ones to say that. That they didn't come up with it. So you're saying that. that will happen to us about what we did, that we'll realize it just was who we were destined to be? Oh, absolutely. And the more we evolve... But, but, you're, but, but you're, not, you're not saying this from the... Even though you might sound... Like if there, there's, a, there's a celebrated... Uh, biologist in Stanford University. Unfortunately, he's a, also a celebrated atheist named Robert Sapolsky, and he he he, indoct, he indoctrinates his his students. I've watched quite a few of his lectures in Stanford because yeah. he's funny, yeah. and Wait, you know. Who wrote the Why don't get ulcers? Um, he could have. He's really he's really good. He's a a, yeah, as a biologist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he you know he 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 berates his students. He says, if you believe that you have free choice, you're in for a shock here. You know, like he, he, yeah. but, but, but it's coming from a different perspective. It's coming, he. Well, he's right, and of course he's very wrong, but. Because, um, because I, I want you to make that clear why, meaning in terms of like, you have a perspective that has to do with ultimately that there's a rut zone, a bigger rut zone at work here. It's not simply biology playing out in us that we think we're t making a choice, but we're, uh, we aren't because just like a, uh, just like a dog reacts a certain way a human does in a more sophisticated way, but there's some Ratzon Ha'elyon that is is higher than our individual Ratzon. Our, 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 our individual experience of Bechira is within the framework of a greater Ratzon that allows for that Bechira and holds it on the one hand and, and transcends it on the other and ultimately will realize the transcendent element of what's now hidden from us. Right, right. You, you see, um, we do, on many, many levels, of course we, we do have freedom of choice, but you have to look at it as um, one element um, interwoven with the biggest, biggest picture of that we are going to follow the, the will of Hashem. But there are many, many levels of the Ratzon that are um, dividing and unfolding. Um, and it, it certainly um, appears, and on some level, we have to believe that we do have um, an element of freedom to choose one thing over the other. Um, however, it, it, what we need to think about, we need to think of it like this. We have to wake up every morning um, thinking that, you know, it's all up to us what's going to happen today. What am I going to accomplish? What am I going to do that's good? 
everything, we, we, we have to believe that it's all in our hands. How much money we're going to make, how much we're going to accomplish. We have to believe that it's all in our hands. But when we come home, we have to realize whatever we did, Hashem really did. So we have to live with that. Is that Shabbos? Do you think that that's what Shabbos is about? Like you work, you have six days a, uh, a week, you shall work. And then Shabbos is like, you no, know, this is really God. And then, but then you go back to work. Exactly. Exactly. And you have to understand the two um, as one whole. You know, Sheish is Yamim Tavod. And then, Bayom Ashri, Shabbat to Hashem Elokecha. That exactly your point is that the, the two have to be understood as one interwoven whole. And that's our reality. Now, the, the, the Baal Salaam does say, or Bashla does say, that our biggest freedom lies in our ability to change our environment. So our freedom, uh, quote unquote, rests mostly in our ability to change the environment that we live in. Now that doesn't mean that we have to change the physical uh, reality, the physical domain or place where we're living, but most important is the state of consciousness, the state of mind that we're in. Now you remember that Yosef, how did he overcome, how did he make the wise choice, uh, right? What was what what enabled him to do so is that he changed his he changed his environment. He he had the image of his father in his mind. So that means he changed his mental state, his environment, his mental environment, mm -hmm. and that's what enabled him to uh, to make the to make the the right choice. So we all have that ability to change our environment. But what amazing about Rabbi Ashlag says is that. As sure as night follows the day, when we are in a certain environment, we don't have freedom uh, because we're going to be swept along by the by the, the masses, by the by the, 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 the powerful forces that are so far beyond us that we're always going to be trying to you know we're always copying our neighbor and trying to you know exceed the the, 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 the what the, our neighbors have you know our will. Um, increases exponentially, by the way, more than animals. Why? Because we, when we look at what our friends um, develop or create, or someone that we don't even know but we hear about, and we go, wow, that's interesting. Oh, now I desire that. And I never even had that desire before. That's why in, um, the environment is so critical, both for our good and for our potential downfall because so is is the environment is the environment more critical than what you yourself like believe in um well uh yeah yeah it really is the environment is key um because we're all products of our environment and that's why um it's so critical to you know change your environment and to keep your environment pure you know, uh, you know, like when, whenever I go into a taxi, I immediately tell the taxi driver to turn off the radio. Oh, I thought you were going to say you wipe it down <laughs> with <laughs> <Yeah>. Clorox. <laughs> no, I thought you were talking about germs now. <laughs> yeah, germs. But, you know, germs, there's all kinds of germs. Um, and I think we're, you know, we're so um, swept by, by our environment um, and that, yeah, we, we, that's the most important variable in, in terms of what determines who we are and who we can become. Um, so, you know, by the way, this gets into this, another key idea of Rabbi Ashlag and seen in the, and through the, the Arizal, definitely through the Arizal, and the Arizal is just an explanation of the Zohar, is that the, the level of the will, there are four main elements of the will. So now we're getting to another main topic of um, the Zohar and the, and the Arizal, is that the levels of the will is one, you know, we see a very basic level of, you know, will, even in the inanimate world, in the way atoms work and the pull of, elect of protons and the repel of electrons, etc., um, the pull of protons to electrons. So we see in the inanimate world there's an idea of its own. Then we see, of course, in, um, how how would you translate that in a scientific term? Yeah, because there's there's a there's a uh, there's a, there's a pull of attraction and a pull of 
of repulsion of so, so you could you you think ratzon could could include um, that ratzon isn't necessarily like individually based. It gets back to the meaning. The ratzon is like programmed in a way. Oh yeah, but by the way, that's just one of the reasons, in my opinion, although I never read it, that Rabbi Ashlag uses this language. Rabbi Ashlag was, you know, the, the 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 greatest philosopher of his generation, of our generation. Um, he, in the sense that he he used this language to be able to bridge. The, the world, the internal world of uh, the human and the external world of science to use a, a, a language that can unify both in terms of how they uh, function and operate. Um, so the, there is a So you think he of, was doing this because he was aware of science? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. But philosophy... And that had a big impact on its influence on why you are well, really yeah, involved in it? Philosophy, the, his level of uh, knowledge, I mean, of philosophy was, you know, he was on the, he engaged them, whether, not personally, but in his, in his articles, talking about Hegel, talking about Marx, talking about Kant, talking about all of them, and Spinoza, but also his level of um, knowledge of, um, for example, the mind-body problem and how, you know, how we can impact. Uh, the, 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 the physical world, how we can possibly change it. You know, philosophy ended um, when they realized we don't have answers. They said, okay, well, we're just going to leave it for science mm -hmm. to come up with the, you know, answers to these questions that philosophy was never able to answer. You know, for example, like the idea of consciousness or the idea of how consciousness or the human can, uh, can impact on a physical world uh, and, and change it in, in certain ways. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, certainly on um, on a level, uh, at a deeper level, um, in, in the sense that you know, how can our consciousness really uh, change something that's uh, physical? How do the two interact? And how does you know, how does the mind affect the body? Mm -hmm. Are the are these mm -hmm. two different realities with different language that that are, is necessary for each domain? Mm -hmm. Or is there one language that unifies both, so that now we can understand how their how the mind and the body really are one, or how uh, consciousness and matter are really one, or how consciousness can really impact on matter? So the the the, uh, the Baal Sulam through the the idea of the Ratzon um, answers and unifies these different answers these questions and unifies these uh, seemingly disparate uh, domains. So, so then we have on the level of, you know, the vegetative world, we see plants, how they move to, to the sun, how they take in nutrients and water, suck it up from deep roots beneath, beneath the earth, deep down into the earth. And then we see in the animal world, there's another level of its own, but only in the human world do we see a level of its own that grows exponentially mm -hmm. just like viral infections grow exponentially so does the will of the human being it grows exponentially to a degree that it could create atom bombs and use mm -hmm. them that it could create ultimate evil mm -hmm. and use the evil to hurt other human beings mm -hmm. animals can't do that but they have a right own but they don't have the fourth level of the Ratzon that only human beings have. And that is will lead us to the Mashiach, or it can lead us to great, great calamity. And we know that it's going to lead us to the Messianic era, and that's only because we have this fourth level of the mm. Ratzon mm. that does grow exponentially, but we're going to know how to use it properly like on the day of the days of Shavuot mm -hmm. that we're going to be able to use that powerful element of Hametz of the will on the fourth level that can erupt exponentially and as we see it is happening and I'm not talking about the epidemic I'm talking about the, the consumerism and materialism and consumption that was over what was choking us to death and now do we have an opportunity now, to, at the time of Shuot, to now understand what are the forces operating on us, 
And how can we use the message of Shavuot and Pesach and the seven weeks in between to be able to take a, 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 a new view of reality? Rafi, okay. Rafi, just finish this thought because I want to, because our time is almost up and I wanted to get... That, uh, that is the end of the thought, so, is to be able to use the forces within us for the good. So we come to the, to the point of Shavuot that we are the ones that are voluntarily, uh, we are, which quote unquote, our free will, I'm using that word to make, the point. You know, to bring more holism into this conversation, that we are now t- returning the light from us, from within us, up to the heavens, so that our love is true, that our giving is true, and that we're able to um, receive all the, the great gifts of Hashem and not be um, tempted, or it will not overwhelm us, and we will use it in the right way. We'll use it for, for the forces of improving the lives of everyone and, and having pure love, which is not kalui b'davar, that we take ourselves out of the equation and that we give selflessly, just like... Um, uh, Pr- Primo Levi describes in the co- in the concentration camp when at the last 10 days when he was in the concentration camp was the worst 10 days when the Germans already left and they, it was bitter cold and they Primo Levi and two others realized well we could make a fire and the fire made them all warm and then a few others who had just a piece of bread said, we have to give back to, to them. So they t- gave them half of their bread. Mm. And that, Primo Levi said, that's when I realized that what being a human is all about. And I was transformed to being just a, a thing amongst things to a human being of, total, of selflessness and living true to what a human being is all about. That was what Primo Levi said. Beautiful. That's beautiful. If we could just end on, um, if you could give maybe a, a recommendation of so, something that, that you think is worth people reading, either Zohar or, 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 or similar to the Zohar, perhaps in English. Well, there's a number of articles that um, the Bala Salam wrote that were translated. Some of them were translated by uh, the, the Mahon that I'm involved with. Um, that Rabbi Brandwine started, that we have translations. There are some of these articles that are, that are a little bit dense. I also have um, uh, uh, the introduction um, that Rabbi Brandwine wrote to his book that's translated into English. I What's that called? More copies for anyone. And then... Um, that, that's I, actual put at, published as a book form, right? Well... Or is it... The, or is it... A, or is so it certainly have those um, copies that I could order for people. Um, and um, yeah, we're in the process of, you know, creating, you know, like a syllabus that uh, will be available. But I think, you know, there, there's a need for the teaching of this because, yeah. you know, one time I was with a friend and he said to me, um, you know, what book could I get? You know, I said, well, there are books out there, but unfortunately there aren't that many books that really, I can't say that there's one that really is going to be what's right for you. And I said, ultimately, he's going to be learning and studying. And um, he did. And he studied with me for two years. And, and he said, I finally, I know, many, many months after, he said, I realized what you mean is that it's very difficult to put this into a book. It really requires um, learning um, from, you know, teacher to student and but of course, we need more than that, and um, it, it's something that I'm working on. Well, thank you, Rafi. I, I, I got some positive uh, feedback already while we're on the line. People saying it's great, and they want to thank you, and I certainly want to thank you. And, and uh, what's good about this is it has been recorded, and I was able to get uh, about 75% of it up on Facebook already. Um, so... You know, this is this is this is stuff that that we can learn. It's there, there are there are translations of the Zohar. They may not all either any one of them may have its 
you know, issues. That, but and that's why what Rafi is talking about is is that to get the to get even more is to study it with the you know with the teacher and not just to read it as a translation. But there is a value. There's definitely a value to to studying the Tsar even sure. bef- even even when you can't get a, a actual teacher. And yeah. I, and I want to thank you, Rafi, for for coming on. Rafi, it was a, like I like I mentioned before, a big a big part of the 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 Kabbalah kind of bringing it to the Upper West Side and and to the United States, particularly with Rabbi Brandwine, but but also on your own shiurim that you've given over the years and and helping helping be a, a kickstarter to the Day of Kabbalah and. And other thank programs. So thank you, Rafi, for everything. Thank You're, you for having me. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad we got to do this. I know, like, we were finally going to do this. Uh, we were going to do this in, in actually in Shul. And uh, unfortunately, you know what happened. We basically don't have Shul anymore in person. So I'm glad we, we that didn't stop us and we're doing this at least virtually. So, so thank you so much, Rafi. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And um, you have questions? Thanks. Email, email, or text uh, me or Rafi, and we'll we'll uh, see what we can do to end. To to uh, so thank you everyone for for listening. I'm gonna end the meeting, and uh, a good night to everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.